Okay, so uh, I'm on the board, and uh, since our leader is the first speaker, I will serve to introduce him, Wolfgang Dahman, who has come to South Carolina just recently. I used to be in South Carolina, by the way. He is the real years ago, and I'm now at Texas A&M. But uh, Wolfgang is an old friend, great mathematician, many awards, prizes, among which the Leibniz Prize from Germany, which is the highest scientific prize you can get. I don't think it gives you too much money, but no. but uh, <laughs> a lot of prestige. And Wolfgang is a stalwart in both uh, approximation, harmonic analysis, and numerical analysis. And this meeting, I guess, is going to be about numerical computation. And he's going to give the first talk, which is going to sort of set the, give the setting for the subsequent talk. So, Wolfgang. Thank you very much, Ron. Also, thanks for, for, doing, <coughs> for doing this job. Um, yeah. My name is Wolfgang Dahm, and I would like to welcome first everybody to this uh, spring school. I'm glad uh, I'm glad you made it here. You know, it's a small community, but I hope it will be um, an inspiring discussion and exchange. And in that scope, it is possible to have questions and discussions. And I hope this will also happen. But um, first, uh, let me also introduce the speakers we have brought in lectures from outside, I would say very high caliber people who in their respective fields are well respected, so there's a great chance to to learn. You already have seen one of the four who is at Texas A&M. I think I tried to go more alphabetically. I think Chandra is the next, <laughs> right? So the next one is uh, Professor Bajaj. He is from Texas, University of Texas at Austin, working in this quite famous institution, ISIS. In fact, we have several people uh, coming from the same university. In particular, there is a concentration on Texas, because <laughs> Professor Leszek Demkowitz is also from Texas, Austin, representing ISIS very well. Then J. Gopalakrishnan, Professor Gopalakrishnan, is from Portland University, right? So he's coming far out. He and uh, Professor Debkowitz will represent one particular subject uh, in, in, in that workshop. Now, so what, what, what is the idea? I will oh, start. Oh, I'm so sorry, Benjamin. <laughs> he belongs <laughs> already <laughs> too much. Yeah. <laughs> in this place right like here. So then, of course, Benjamin Berkowitz. Stand up, Benjamin. He is the youngest. Uh, and he is from Germany. In fact, he's coming from Harvard. Yeah. yeah. But he has been here before for a longer period. So he, I, without thinking, I, I consider him as a local. Which I shouldn't do, because he's a visitor for one week. And he, he represents uh, data driven methods, in particular in imaging. Now, uh, why, what is the idea behind, uh, behind this school? And if I look at the scientific landscape, the way it develops and evolves, of course I see these hypes going by. Years ago there was a wavelet hype, then there was a compressed sensing hype. Then there is a UQ, I, then there is big data or deep learning activity. And I imagine for a young researcher, it's very difficult to, to kind of keep overview. And uh, science is getting so diverse and specializes in different areas. It's very difficult to kind of keep some sort of an overview of possible connections between the different fields. But I think the future will be uh, will show that connecting these different fields and make proper use of the con of the concepts that drive these fields will be extremely important. 
also to be able to filter out what is interesting, what will matter, and where should you look for. Particularly at a young age, you are, you are forced to dive into the technicalities of your project and being, being subjected to the way, the point of view represented by the group around you. But for every human has only a limited view. So one major motivation behind an event like this is to try to point to various say interconnections between different conceptual platforms and how they could maybe in the future even better synergize. So that's the overarching goal. And while at the first glance, when you look at the speakers and the topics, you may that may sound they may look like almost random, it isn't. And so there is a little bit of thought of thought behind it. And in this First lecture is not really a lecture. I will, I will try to give an introduction to what we are really interested in, in doing and uh, to give a little bit of a guideline or point to different ways of looking at things. So the technical content will, be, will not be very much. It is more to guide you in a way of looking at things. Okay. So let me try to, to do that now, I hope. I hope it works now. It's doing something. No, it's still on my part. Ah, I need to. I need to slap to. Okay, looks good. I'm glad Scott is here for a possible backup. Okay. Cool. No. Yeah. Um, yes, Scott. So you can't say Scott is good for nothing. <laughs> he actually can do something. <laughs> oh, Scott is extremely Tell you useful. which button to push. Scott, Scott is extremely useful. Mm -hmm. Without him, I would be down the creek without a paddle. Okay. So, Scott, I probably should stand right here somewhere, right? Good. All right. Uh, so, the overarching theme of this workshop is data and, and models. And uh, let me give you a quick overview of what, what I would like to comment on. So, there's a little bit of an uh, introduction with two examples. We will see that there are out there, there are two worlds with a pretty different culture. And uh, it, but it will also hopefully become clear, at least later during the workshop, that it is important for these two worlds to eventually meet. But the question how they actually will exchange information is, not, is maybe part of the problem we all will have to address in the long run. So what is this about, what we want to do here? Little preliminary comments. So everybody observes that mathematical modeling and simulation affect essentially all branches of science, that even more, more so even in social life. And uh, along the way, what we call models, and we are not thinking of a nice person uh, on a gateway, but models in the mathematical sense, in other words, abstractions of reality, stripping off unnecessary details, but they are nevertheless getting more and more complex because we are asking more and more demanding questions along the way. So to deal with these models in order to get a good virtual picture of, of, of reality is of course a joint effort. This is not one discipline itself. In fact, it is getting more and more interdisciplinary. So people from natural sciences, engineering, so natural sciences will come up with foundations of models, engineering, computer science, and in the end, also mathematics. And um, what I would like to bring out a little bit is the type of contributions you can, you can have from mathematics, that bigger picture. Mathematics is not all of it, by no, by no means, but it can do something. And 
One way to put it into a small phrase is perhaps to say the art of shortcuts. One, one objective of mathematics is in fact, sometimes to unveil shortcuts that can get you to an answer in a more clever way than in a brute force method. So that's one aspect. It, to put this out of shortcuts in a different, uh, different wording is perhaps to talk about optimal computation. This is something I learned from Rob. There is a special way, important way of thinking that will eventually clarify the role of mathematics in this interdisciplinary consortium of efforts, which has to do with the fact that a mathematician inherently tries to look for optimal solutions. It's not satisfied with something that works, but there is always this greed and hunger to do it particularly well. And sometimes uh, uh, the distinction between, between just a brute force effort and something much more clever has enabling capability. And of course, we're all dreaming of, of these properties. So optimal computation. But of course, as I say it, that doesn't mean much. Uh, you, have to, you have to be clear what optimality means. And uh, this is, I think, an important question to set up the mathematical context in which you can look at at, at, problem, at given problems. Uh, the first important step is to identify for problem scenario a benchmark or model class to, to, get about, to get an idea what, what actually could be done. What is the intrinsic uh, difficulty of the problem? Where are limitations that you can never overcome? And once you have attained a little bit of understanding, then uh, you can ask, so what is it what, that, that, that can be achieved best? And then to contrive methods that are constructive and actually will realize what, 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 what can be achieved best. Of course, that's an ideal world, and it cannot always be completely carried out in a very complex application uh, context. Uh, Reality may force you to make compromises, but I think it's a it's a wonderful uh, line of thought that gives you an orientation how to eventually attack attack problems. So, what are the playgrounds where where, where, where this is happening? Um, there is something very topical right now, namely data science, and in a very oversimplified way. What is this about? You try to extract information from observations, from measurements. <clears throat> what? Here are examples. Like social networks do that to a great extent. They get a whole lot of information from their observations. And this is your input into the, in, in, into the network. Autonomous driving is another is, is another scenario where humongous data sets are being probed or evaluated and to the extent that the corresponding decision conveyed to a car tells the car what to do. There is a completely different area like structural imaging, like microscopy, spectroscopy. The nowadays advanced sensor technology gives you tremendous amount of information in terms of data which but you have to process and 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 sort of interpret them on in, extract the information that you are really after so the point here is that your material you are working on is given to you through observations they more or less represent an object that you would long, like to learn about and what you primarily what you have is uh, is the observations about the object in particular, this leads to the notorious big data problem. And often people are simply deceived by the word big. They say this is the major obstruction, the fact that the data are big. Of course, it gets all the computer scientists uh, up in arms. They can do uh, clever things to process big data. 
also big data tend to be often corrupted. So getting this information uh, is may, may hard simply because the information is hidden in the deluge of, of data. Um, there is another word, and uh, this maybe has even a much longer tradition in mathematics because it is because it is independent of the ability to have advanced sensor technology or have powerful computers. It's based on models. And you can think of a mathematical model, think of a, of a PDE or a system of a PDE. It describes a process, say, in science or the real world. It describes it approximately. So in a way, it is, a, is a, an encoding device. There's a complicated thing, a flow around an airfoil under all sorts of flight conditions. And you have five lines with PDE that describes <coughs> with some initial conditions and a constituent law or something like that. It's a tremendous encoding, compression of a complex process that's going on. Accordingly, what has kept mathematicians busy for centuries is to decode, which means to solves the PDE again, say something about the solution, and so on. But now the material is not so much a direct observation about what you are, uh, what, what you are interested in, but something you are interested in, objects that are very implicitly defined by, by a model. Okay. And there is, of course, uh, a whole hierarchy of models that live on various scales, depending on the, the way physicists uh, try to describe what is going on on these respective scales. So it could go from atomistic models to macro type models in continuum mechanics, which perhaps are best known in terms of balance laws described by PDEs or integral equations and mixtures of it. <clears throat> so these are the plane laws. These two Words, the data driven efforts in the mathematical world and the model based uh, uh, approaches. And they require different cultures. They, they live in different cultures and they require different concepts. Uh, why is it, will it be more and more important, increasingly important, to actually combine the two? The simple reason is. Models are models. They, they, they idealize things. They, they strip off stuff. So they're never complete. And very often they're very incomplete. In particular in, in areas like uh, mathematical biology, the understanding of models is much less advanced than in physics, say. So, so that... One world by itself is not, is, is, is not complete enough. Then these models, as they become more and more complex, they may depend on many parameters, which you may have to calibrate in order to actually get an information out of it. Or they have to be determined. And um, how, do you, how, how do you determine that? Well, you could say the model is only a family of possibilities that could happen. And if I take measurements in addition to it, then, then I may fix these parameters that, 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 that quantify things. But then you often see that the amount of data you have is not an abundance. In fact, it's very often too few. Very often, in particular, if you have many parameters to fit, then typically the number of data observations you have would be extreme, would have to be extremely large to pin them down exactly, and you usually don't have that. So there is more an undersampling problem. So what you see on TV all the time, in particular around fall and, 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 and late summer, when the hurricane season comes, and they come up with these predictions where the hurricane will go. This is a typical uh, example. There are models like convection equations that, that tell you how airflow and temperature changes will, 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 will occur. And of course, when you see these planes flying into the eye of a hurricane, they don't do that for fun. They, they, they try to take measurements. 
And these measurements will be needed in order to complete, in order to facilitate the prediction based on these, on, 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 on these models. Underground explore, uh, exploration is another typical thing where you would like to know what the structure underneath is because you may be looking for something like oil or so, but you can't see it. You can drill holes, but you can only drill a few holes. And there are not so many measurements you can take in order to unveil the, the full complexity of, of that underground uh, uh, <coughs> material. Structural imaging and material science is another huge uh, playground where, where this plays a role. So the problem then is, which, which, which forces sort of to, to, to combine the data-driven uh, approaches and the, the model-based approaches is a task like model identification or how do you, how do you actually incorporate measurements, these are numbers, maybe, into the PDE model. Well, many of you who may have worked on these problems may not actually question of them. They say, well, what the hell? I mean, what do you mean by how to combine? And here I have my numbers, maybe top thousand measurements, could be hundred thousand, but my numbers. Here's my PDE, it doesn't matter, I discretize it, and then I have numbers too on the PDE side. What keeps me from putting these numbers on, on the same page? Well, I hope I will get you to the point that you realize that it's not that simple that uh, another aspect will sneak into the picture that, uh, uh, that should give you second thoughts on, on exactly this part. And uh, the idea of data assimilation and its principal mathematical aspects, for instance, will be addressed in, in one step at the beginning. So these are, these are principal aspects that look abstract on a very general level, but I think it would be very wise to keep that in mind when you do an actual computation, as opposed to blindly hack away. Right? So that is maybe the message. So what are typical issues that you might perceive as a mathematician to, uh, to be obstructions? Well, there's one superficial, easily recognized issue. When you have a, a PDE family that depends on many parameters, like when you don't know what the diffusion coefficient is, but you have a parameterization of actually a field that could represent the state you are interested in, then your solution will not only be a function of x and t, time and space, it will be also a function of the parameters. And if you have a under parameters sitting in your PDE that are not, first of all, free, are not calibrated, your function will be a function of 103 variables, 104. Try to discretize function with 104 variables, or say a function with 50 variables. How to discretize them? The most simple way is to take a grid, say mesh size deep mesh size explains the exact explain, uh, the mesh size determines how accurate your numerical approximation eventually is but take a cube side length one in 50 dimensions half the mesh size so now you have a mesh size a half it's a ridiculous approximation but you already have two to the 50 children and you see, that is caused, that has to do with the curse of dimensionality. Uh, computational effort explodes with, with the dimension. So when you are hunting for functions that depend on many variables, there is a problem. There's a principal problem. Uh, of course, you only see that principal problem when, you, when your computation insists on a quantifiable property. If, if you want, in the end to say, whatever I did here, I know what I got. I, I, I can compare it to what my ideal goal would be. I mean, there's no point in showing somebody, oh, I can, I can make a computation with so many unknowns if you have no idea what the approximation in the end is. So the quantification of accuracy 
which is very important. I mean, this is the UQ hype, uncertainty quantification, is a modern word for lots of these ingredients that, uh, that may uh, uh, keep you from, from giving accurate answers. And, and high spatial dimensionality and its computational complexity is one. The other one I, 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 um, I all, all already mentioned before. I, my claim is when, 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 you, when you merge model-based approaches and data-driven approaches, you have to determine a metric in which you assess accuracy and closeness. And that choice of the metric may be extremely relevant. I give you an example everybody knows. And it doesn't have to do anything yet with, with data and models. It only has to do with the choice of a metric. That's, that's the only thing. You take Parsons equation. Is there, there should be markers here, right? It's outside the Yeah. Need that, The simplest PDE you have ever met. Something like this. Now, what do you do? You discretize, then you get another equation. On a grid. This is now a matrix. Now, when you when you when when you solve this equation, usually this is very big. You don't solve it exactly. You solve it approximately. How do you assess accuracy? Well, because it's a vector in a humongous Euclidean space, you take the Euclidean norm. That means you take the Euclidean norm for this, and you take the Euclidean norm for this one too, which is the right-hand side. In other words, when you assess accuracy, you view a, as, say, a mapping from one space into itself with the same topology. So you clearly measure it because these are vectors you get. Okay? Now, why do you get ill-conditioned problems? Anybody in any Do you, Everybody knows that you get an ill-conditioned problem. The condition number of this matrix goes like h to the minus 2. It goes to infinity when h, when you measure that, goes to the Why is that? Why is that? Has anybody thought about this? Why, why this is the case? You're asking the children? Yes, you have to. You are not <laughs> Because you are imposing the wrong metric on the problem. The original operator. This one goes from a function space <coughs> to its dual. That changes two orders of, of regularity. It is an isomorphism. It's bijective. But it is from one function space to a different. And this one you view as an operator from one function space to the same. And in that metric, it is not bound to be convertible. And therefore, it's a real condition. This is what you take. And it's take numerical analysis decades to come up with preconditioners that solve their problem. If you think of it. Because it's a, you, you, you took a point of view that was, that, was, that was created over decades to say, oh, very simple. Here's, a, here's an operator equation. I discretize it. And now I have a discrete problem. Forget about everything else. Now I have a black box. And I look for numer numerical linear algebra tools that deal with that black box. And then you spend 20 years to find a good precondition. This is, uh, I know, it's slightly provocative, but I want to, want to bring that point up. This is behind a lot of 
we will be talking about. Because seemingly discrete problems are often not just discrete. And very often you can handle them only if you do not forget their background. And if you merge data and models, you better do not forget the background. That is, that, that, is a, that, that is a major point. And I would say, while in this simple forward problem there's an issue, which you can cure. I mean, no, people are clever enough to find these preconditions. But uh, when you do uh, data assimilation, it's really an inverse problem. And in inverse problem, the conditioning is even a more severe point than in these simple problems. This is a well-conditioned equation. This one is a well-conditioned equation. That this one is not well-conditioned is simply because the numerical analysis, uh, analysis box up. That's the only reason. So it's, it's self-inflicted. Okay? You could make it well-conditioned. But it's not obvious so. Can he disturb you? Yeah. So, you know, okay, since you provoke me. <laughs> so, so you challenge you will kill some, right? I always have been told by the numerical analysis, numerical linear algebra colleagues, that the computer thinks in terms of discrete L2. What the, and, yeah, the computer is only a dumb machine. Yeah, so, so, so if I'm, and therefore if I'm interested in assessing, you know, the, the relation between their ill conditioning and the round of error, I have to, right? This is my question, yeah. what I really do. I have to think in terms of discrete L2 metric, and therefore have to, my job is to connect the two worlds, right? But yeah, are you no. telling me that I don't have to think no, in terms I of think you have to, but at the same time, you have to think how, in this world of numbers, you take into account that this, the mapping was going from that's here clear. to here. That's, that, that's my point. But my question is, can we override Wilkinson to begin with? No, no, no. No, you're Wilkinson, not challenging that. No, you're no, I'm not challenging that. The Wilkinson is a, is a problem that's always there. Even if I have a perfect precondition, I have to worry about floating point arithmetic and stability. This is something that's, this world, I can't do anything about it. You can, you can uh, scale up architecture. You can go to higher precision, and you will, you, you will reduce this kind of influence. But this is there, independent of what you do on on, on, on the numeric, uh, on the on the other side. But the problem I was addressing here is simply because looking only at the black box, you forget what this problem comes from. You make a big mistake, which 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 you cannot recover anymore when looking at the thing as a black as a black box. <clears throat> Optimal preconditions are all analysis based, all of them. So it's what you input into the black box. You don't input the original discretization. You do a preconditioner and yes. input a better problem. Yes. The, black the preconditioner box. is my expert knowledge. I input into the machine. And then the machine, within its <laughs> domain of, 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 of ability, can, can use that. But that is not a question of just the machine architecture. That is a question of essentially how we do the precondition. And that is, I claim, with any kind of inverse problem, this is even more so the case. Because, because they are even more susceptible, uh, more susceptible to, uh, to, to, uh, to conditioning issues. Where a small perturbation in, in some data will, will get you, will get a tremendous, has a tremendous impact on the result. I see a lot of question marks. You should be free to ask. No worries. I'm thinking. You're thinking. That's good. That's, that's, that's part of it. By the way, you don't have to be able to exactly now understand what I'm saying. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm shaking you up. Then we will have to take notes where you have questions. We, we can discuss it later. And that's part of the thing. I mean, we will have breakout sessions. You, you should be free to ask any kind of question. Take notes where something completely obnoxious comes out of you and say that I can't leave it like that. So okay? Well let me let me continue. So really this is in this world where we where we where we are trying to marry say the model with data, it's really a small data problem. Your 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 big enemy is not the fact that you have too many data. Your big enemy is the fact that you have too little information. If you have hundred 
if you have 500 parameters to fix and you have only 20 observations, you are dead in the water unless you do something. You use additional information. And what is that additional information could be coming from a model? Because it's like a prior. It, it tells you with your 100 measurements, you do not have to search through a a zillion dimensional space, you only search on a smaller set of all possible states that could satisfy that equation. This reduces your, your candidates for what you are after tremendously. So that is the, the way of thinking. So here's this little cartoon example. Here's a, here's a model. The model is a diffusion model. So you think of Darcy flow and eventually you have to solve an elliptic problem. And, uh, and, 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 uh, so here is an elliptic PDE, uh, the <coughs> gradient of U, there is a diffusion coefficient. Here it's really a permeability and the divergence operator on the right hand side plus boundary conditions. It's not, that's not important right now. But what is this? This, this coefficient is to, is to describe the permeability of this material where you would like to understand the porous flow, the flow through this porous material. Okay? And how this flow evolves depends on the permeability condition, on a condition in the PDE. Okay, so one way to ask if you are standing here, you, you try to look downstairs and see what is happening there. I would like to understand what this um, what the underground what the underground looks like. And you may be measuring some some flow of this porous medium flow at some place. And you would like to infer back what the structure here is. In other words, you would like to know what this coefficient is from output of the equation, from additional measurements. But as you see, you can only drill holes at several places and then we measure the pressure head, how far the water comes up there, and, and try to use this information together with the fact that whatever flow you observe eventually has to satisfy a law like this, and from that to infer back to the to, uh, to the parameter. Or this is a notoriously ill-posed problem it's called EIT, so electron impedance tomography. I think. So what people here try to do is um, they try to get a good picture of how you look inside without cutting you up. Instead of cutting you up, they put some electrodes around you. And then they, they put some, they inject the current at all these places, and they measure, as a response, a voltage. And from these, these are the observations you make. And you don't want to, to expose that patient to a zillion of these <laughs> high currents. So you would like to get away with a with, with few of these measurements, and from that you would like to, to estimate the, con uh, the conduction field in a, in a PDE, which has roughly the same uh, structure as, uh, as I said before. So it's a notoriously ill post in, in, in post problem again. Where, of course, when you model this interior to describe it mathematically, you have to parameterize this geometry, it's clear that it has many parameters. If you, uh, if you are built in a complicated way inside, and I guess most of us are, then you need many parameters to, to describe this and, uh, and, and to, to, to get those parameters out of uh, such measurements. You can imagine this is a difficult thing. So you always have too few. You never have too many. This is a small, this is a small uh, data problem. So these are the two worlds. The one which is driven by big data big data problem, you have information in terms of samples, you, and given such samples from an empirical process, you would like to learn from it a functional relation that relates these parameters, say the x variable, to its labels, the y parameters. And you would like to find an f that explains how, how these tuples evolve. We want to learn a function. Um, we'll say in a moment what, what that is. And this is a typical setting you have in machine learning. So you, 
you may even assume or maybe entitled to assume that you can sample that process which you would like to understand independently many times big data so you have many samples in the end but that's what you have your, your model is very limited in that sense you don't have a law like a PDE or so that, 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 that tells it and the goal would then be to derive from those observations here measurements and estimate that approximates this unknown hidden functional relation. And a particular instance of this is when your image domain, that function should map into some, if this image domain is a continuum, then you typically end up with a regression problem. Maybe a little more clear than before. If this image domain is finite or discrete, you may end up with something like this classification. These are problems maybe of different category because it makes a big difference when what you map into is a very small set, a discrete, a discrete set. And just to give you, now what does it mean to get quantifiable information? What is the mathematician interest? It's not the interest to cook up a, a very powerful efficient uh, method that creates this estimator and in the end you have no idea what this estimator does. It looks plausible, but you would like to be able to evaluate what it does and to quantify it. And a typical framework is what I just said is regression. So 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 here is a here is such a such a setting. Here are here are the X labels. I think Ron came once up with this nice example of a, of a bank. Say the bank, the bank keeps the data side where it collects all sorts of information about customers. And the customers come in and they would like to have a loan. And the bank says, I'm not going to give that loan right away. I ask first some questions. So the X variable is 10 questions like, How old are you? What's your, what's your sex? What kind of property do you have? What's your what kind of mortgages do you have? Things like this. It's a vector x. And then they have recorded the success of giving a loan to them. This is the label y. Maybe the rate of success. It's a range of success. So they have accumulated over the years. Oh, it's hard to see. Ah, oh, shit. The resolution is bad. So what it does is every point x for a customer has several possible returns because some customers, not all, this, all the customers have, were, were equally successful with that loan. But all the returns for a single answer, a, a single um, answer set, set of answers to, to your 10 questions, to, in other words, to the variable x, to a specific point, it has a certain distribution, which is a conditional expectation. And that conditional expectation that sort of takes the distribution around the responses for each x. This is what's called the regression function. And in machine learning, the question would be, how do you estimate that regression function? Because that would tell you, for a new customer, who says his answers, oh yeah, this, this is about his success rate. We can take him or not, okay? So in the end of the day, you you, you, you give a mathematical formalism in, type of, in, 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 in terms of that, such, such a regression function which you would like to, to estimate as a conditional expectation. You would like to, to, to know the expected return, success return, given a certain quality of your client in terms of answers to these questions. So, and in the end, it's at least uh, it's an L2 error you are, you are interested in. And here's a typical result from a mathematical point of view that, that you might accept as, oh, I quantify my, I quantify my, uh, my analysis. I say I have, I've constructed an estimator which approximates this regression function, and this, according to this split, is the best you, can ever, you could ever have. And what you would like to say is the probability that this estimator deviates from the true regression function, which of course you will never know 
by an amount that scales with the number of samples like this. You don't have to understand it why 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 this next one is just a sample result. The probability that that error, that misestimation, is bigger than a certain threshold that goes to zero when the number of samples stands is small. And 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 finding estimates that give you say the rate here and give you the quantification of, of, of the probability for which, uh, by, by, uh, how small it is for, for this to be missed, and so on. That would be, in this case, a quantification of a mathematical answer. It's, it's quite different from when you ask what is the accuracy of a solution to a PDE. You, you, you give some numbers involving properties of the solution and the mesh size of the discretization, that's it. So. But in either in each case, it is a quantified response. And 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 yes, S and beta are related somehow. Well, S, uh, 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 well, this is only a sample, so it's, it's true. So what what's behind this? When when you go into in, in, in these kind of foundational activities in machine learning, what people try to do is under certain assumptions on this regression function has a certain smoothness, like a solution to a PDE. It has a best possible rate of result that can be achieved in such an estimator, and, and S. And the goal would be, you find that estimator, an estimator that achieves that rate, which has to do with the regularity of the regression function. Like with the solution of a PDE, if it's H2, you have a best order you can get. You can never get more than that, right? But you would like to achieve that order by your, by your method. And if, if, you, if you base your method on a priori estimates, then you basically choose a priori your mesh size to meet an expected error bound like this. But if you don't know whether the solution is H2, then there is a best way but you don't know how to choose your mesh size in order to achieve the best rate. And here, a typical question asked by people in machine learning or asked by us in our, our previous world is, can you come up with estimators that don't have to know how regular this is? And if that regression function has a certain optimal rate, the estimator will catch it. And that, that, that gives you a quantifiable uh, <coughs> performance. Okay, so the issues here are what are best estimators, what are suitable continuous model classes for the regression functions for which you can expect a certain rate and things like this. So universality is what I just said, you would like the estimator to always sense what is best for this particular problem and adapt to it. And you can see what this is driving to, that this is only possible if you're willing in your schemes to employ nonlinear schemes. That's one of the keywords. Adaptivity is one, one expression of nonlinearity. An adaptive scheme uses, when it progresses, information it had acquired before. So that depends on the particular solution or object you are searching for. It will change from solution. It's not a linear process. So what you do cannot be just copied in the next instance and, and do again. So that is behind it. And that has actually, in mathematics, has stirred a lot of activity to, to, to understand this interplay of being universal in terms of recognizing the, the obstructions in your problem automatically and, and, and non-linearity. Well, again, high spatial dimensionality if that object, you are, if that regression function depends on many variables. Like if the bank asks the client not 10 questions, but 1,000 questions, then you have to attach a label to a function of 1,000 unknowns. And then you are back into this cube subdivision problem that approximating a function of 1,000 unknowns is inherently difficult okay? and requires a lot of work you may not be able to invest. And there are new, numerous applications, and some some of them will be some of them will be addressed in that workshop. See, but again, you don't have to understand this now. But there is imaging will be in this workshop. 
will be one of the topics to be addressed, where, 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 where things like this uh, come up. So the model, now, yeah, now we come back to my food flight. Uh, I'm going over time already. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I hope. Yeah. You you should ask. Now you are back to the model-based approach. Now what is what is it? What is a model-based approach? So there's a physical technological process which is described by you unknown. You for unknown. Could be a flow field, could be a pressure field, pressure field, could be a vector of unknown fields. It is described typically, say, in the continuum mechanical framework by, by a balance law, an operator equation or a PDD with additional side conditions. Let's just abstractly write it as you, you, you try to find a U that satisfies a balance law. In other words, when you insert it in, in, a, in an operator equation with some data F, you get a perfect balance. <coughs> that, that operator equation is typically an expression that involves derivatives of u, temporal, spatial derivatives of u, or whatever you, you, you can think of. And maybe the data appear as right hand side, but this is not. Oh, I didn't, I didn't want, this is not. Um, this is not essential. So, this. As I said before, the model encodes that you and, 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 and you have to find it. The situation is aggravated when that model depends on additional parameters, like in our groundwater problem before. When the diffusion parameter was not one parameter, but was a family of parameters, which could explain the flow. Okay? So now, that, if that function uh, in that diffusion problem, which had the zigzagging, Suppose the parameters are just the coefficient for that piecewise linear function. These are the unknown parameters which you would like to which you would like to learn. Then this is a function, then the solution becomes not only a function of the space and time variables, but also of this additional problem. So here we are again in this high dimensional setting, and uh, what will pop up several times is this solution manifold. That is if you have a parameter-dependent family of PDEs, you have a set of states that are solutions of that PDE for various parameters. So when, you, when your parameters trace through a certain domain, each, for each new parameter you get another state, another solution, and the entity of those forms what some people call a solution manifold. And this is a very, very frequent scenario you find yourself and it's only put in, abs in abstract forms. Whenever you are doing some calibration of a model, you're really looking for all the states corresponding to these various parameters which you want to calibrate and want to choose maybe in such a way that some optimality criterion is, 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 is fulfilled. But eventually it, it tells you you have to look at this the set of these states somehow you have to get a hold of in some in some way or the other. Now the forward problem is then simple. Uh, you try to find u such that it solves this problem. And if there is a parameter dependence, then you have to do that for every y. And that could, of course, already be impossible. And here's again my fruit fly as the simplest example. Okay, this now, now my f is just minus uh, f plus delta u. This is my the simple, that was this, that is sort of the maybe your model type. In this case, is f plus delta u, and that has to be zero. And you are looking for the u that, that, that satisfies this. So, but what I'm interested in is something else. So, so what, as again, I said before, what do people do? Well, they immediately go to uh, discretization, discretize it, get a finite algebraic system. <coughs> and now you feel okay. You say, because, oh, I know, I have my shelf of software high-powered from this finite discrete problem. I hit it with this 
and I will get a solution. Okay, that's true. That works for many cases very well. But what are what are the questions you could attach to this problem? Well, first question is: This is exactly the, sorry. This is exactly the situation you encounter when you fix a discretization. You fix a discretization. Say you take a mesh, two million mesh points. Now you have a discrete problem of size two million unknown. Two million unknown. What is the what what is the numerical analyst doing now? Is asking how can I efficiently solve that? No. And typically, what it requires you to do is to come up with a good precondition. And meanwhile, preconditioning for this problem are extremely well understood. And that took a while, but it's they're extremely well understood. But other problems, it may be by no means well understood. Okay. So. Um, so that's a task. We address it for fixed discretization. As I said, you can become more greedy. You can say, why a fixed discretization? Why do I know whether this discretization I choose isn't exactly good enough? Or maybe it's too good. Maybe I, 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 I waste computing power because a much smaller discretization would have done for my purposes. So you are asked to to optimize discretizations, and then you are in this back in this nonlinear world. The same way as for the estimators in the regression. You try to adapt to the particular solution, and then I will give an example where this is uh, this makes a, a blatant uh, blatant difference. And again, if this problem is in addition parameter dependent, you have again the, the, the problem of high dimensionality that you have to address. So here's my claim. In order to address these problems in a sense, and that I go back to my original pro provocation, you have to go back to the, to the question, for, to the forward problem, given f, and I say, where? Any f? Can I take any f? Find the u, and again, where can I take any u? I can give you a simple problem like this, and it, with a maybe not so simple domain, and I say, if now u, you choose u as the functions that are twice continuously differentiable, you make a bad choice. You create acting the post problem. So, well, you can say, I don't see that. As soon as I've discretized, I don't see that. I don't see what happens in, in my function space. But you also don't have a precondition. Because you don't know how to undo the mapping property from one space into another one. Okay? So this is it. So my claim is there is an interplay, a very, very strong interplay between the finite and infinite dimensional problem. And if you want to go in the direction of an optimal computation, in the sense I said before, you, you have to you think about this. That is, you have to think about what is this and what is this, where you actually look, try to solve your problem. We you make that a little more precise. Here is, here is a hint of how you can get that in principle, how you can move towards this goal. Let me call it ideal stability. What is ideal stability? I, 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 I start with a wish. So that would be my goal. It would be perfect. I would say if I can do that, I'm, I'm very happy. So I cannot solve this exactly because that function is not given in terms of an analytic expression. I can approximate it. Let you bar be some approximation. And I would like to be able to assess that error. I would like to say, is that good enough? Or do I have to do more? Based on an a priori estimate, this is really not sufficient. Because the a priori estimate has assumptions on regularity, which may not be satisfied. So I would like to assess it. The only thing for a given u I can assess is the residual. Think of it. It's a principal thing. You can assess the residual at best. Because this. On this side, you know everything. That operator is given to you. 
that approximation you have constructed, so you have it in, 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 in your computer, that that here are the data which are given to you. So it would be great if you could say that error I'm interested in. And now you have to say in which norm. Obviously, not every norm is equally good for every problem. Like, in the finite dimensional case, it doesn't matter because all norms are equivalent. But that equivalence depends on the dimension. So if you have a high dimension space, even in discrete, it matters already through the equivalence constant. But here it may matter even more. You may have a PDE which has Jalowski discontinuities. Then you cannot take H1 as the norm to measure your, your solution because it makes no sense. Your, 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 your solution doesn't belong to that space. There is usually a space associated with the problem, with the continuous problem, which is reasonable for looking for solutions. And not every space is reasonable. So that is the question mark on U. But no, if you say you, this, I found the reasonable U. In which norm do you measure the residual? For certainly, for sure, not in the same norm. Because that is the problem we were looking at here. That was exactly the reason for ill conditioning when looking at the discrete residual in L2 and the solution also in L2. That's bound to fail. So really the issue is, what is this norm? So you could say it's part of the problem to come up with a norm so that you have a relation like that. So you could view this question, filling this question mark, as part of your problem. I'm sure none of you have thought about this in this way. But think of it, it makes sense. You can, you, well, some of the speakers have thought about this, but not the speakers. So, what is the proper norm so that have you the relation? If you have the proper norm, and if you can even evaluate that, then you have error control. And then you have a posteriori control. Once you have a solution, you can evaluate the error. You can say, what is my next step? And so on and so on. You can say, is my model good enough? And so on and so on. How to get this? How to get a hold of this space? Well, the experts in the room will tell you a lot about it, but I will I try to give you a primer to this. So this, a lot of good stuff will come, but I give you a primer. My claim is you can get it by looking at weak formulations. By saying, okay, I look at my, my equation and I test it with a test function. But now I have to choose which, which function do I test. It's not enough to say C infinity is complex support. What are the test functions that are missable that are reasonable for this? If, if I make up my mind, of course, the necessary condition is, if I choose here a test function, this dual pairing must be well-defined. In other words, whatever this best test function is from, this better is in the dual. Otherwise, this dual pairing is, doesn't exist. So your operator f should have the property that it maps into the dual of your test space. Otherwise, this is not well-defined. So that's the first selection criteria. So that's formally placed here. Well, you could say, well, that's easy to see, or more easily seen for a linear problem. And I want to say it's important to understand for a linear problem because, in principle, you can linearize. If your if your problem is nonlinear, you can linearize. Suppose you have an approximate solution here. Then this nonlinear function f, you could think of it as being approximated locally by a linear function. And solving that linear function means you look for the zero of that linear equation. So this is a zero set for a nonlinear problem, and this is a zero problem for a linear problem. And you see that picture is exactly Newton's method. The, the, only, the only reason why I put up Newton's method is that there is a little wrinkle here. My unknown is sitting in a particular space, and I'm looking for the values in a particular other space, namely that, that value. And it, it is sort of the, it's the task of the mathematician to determine u and v, and therefore v prime before it, in a proper way. And that's part of the lectures that will come up. In, in, in a particular 
in a particular framework. Okay, here we go. So when you are linear, then you, when you have a linear problem, bu equals f or bu minus f is zero, then there is a nice body of, of theory that allows you to say when is your choice of trial and test space good? And when will it give you a stable discretization? And a result of this will be that you have at least a chance to determine what's called local error indicators by evaluating at least approximately this residual. And these quantities will depend only on the data and on the current solution, and they could drive an adaptive an adaptive, an adaptive scheme. But in order to get there so that you have a rigorous control on an adaptive scheme, you have to find a good pair, U and V, so that this theory kicks in. And the DPG framework, which will be treated on, on, on Saturday, is one context where you can, where you can actually do this in, 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 a, in a numerically feasible way. What this buys you is when you have an, a stable problem in this way, you at least in principle have access to adaptive, rigorously uh, uh, founded adaptive refinement techniques. The surrogates for your actual error are given in terms of residuals, which you can, well, there is a lot of mathematical skill going from here to here. This is a subject in numerical analysis to derive a posteriori error indicators that are computable. Because this is a sort of an abstract notion. That's a residual. It's true. Everything is known in this residual. But there's one little wrinkle. The wrinkle is that this is a dual norm. And a dual norm is usually not so easily evaluated because there's a soup inside. Right? So, but it is, it is there. It's now the, the skill of the numerical analyst to make something out of this dual norm. And that something is typically coming up in, 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 in this form. And depending on the problem at hand, this may be, this is of course different, but that is the, the roadmap you, you usually have. So, doing this for adaptive refinements is not even the only issue. I want to stress one more issue, and that ties back to the first talk after, after the coffee break. Namely, this is, has to do with the construction of reduced models. There is a, if, if, you, if you Google model order reduction, you get tons of tons of places. But a closer look reveals that there is a very different level of rigor coming with these results. Some of them are completely heuristic, some of them are completely certified in a way that you could say, I, I, I construct a reduced model and I have a certified bound on the accuracy of that model. This will become will be made much more precise. And the key ingredient is this. To have something, to have something like this, the fact that a mapping property, that you have found a topology, a pair of U and V, so that the induced operator B, when, when viewed as an operator from U to V prime, is an isomorphism. And that's actually also important for the selection of reduced models, because it tells you the way how you project onto a manifold, how, from which angle you look at a manifold. So the, the bottom line is it, it, it's really important to keep that background topology pair in mind, because it affects very strongly what you do on the, con on, 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 on the, on, on the discrete side. So that's kind of the bond between the discrete and the continuous framework. Here's an example which gives you an impression um, of what an adapt such optimal computation or adaptive approach could do for you. Okay? And I, 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 cho I chose it because I know that people are here who are interested in shallow water equations. Things like this, which are notoriously not so nice things because in addition to being hyperbolic, they have a lot of constraints that have to be quantitatively satisfied, like positivity in dry wet areas is difficult to, to remain stable and things like this. So here is, we will look at the following. We look at a flooded city. This is by, uh, these are experiments done by Siegfried Müller, a former colleague of mine from Aachen, and Niels Gerhardt, who was a PhD student at us. So, so here's the, uh, so first of all, to actually validate this 
quantitatively, there's, there's an experiment in a channel. Of course, we have an experiment, the size has to be scaled properly. So these, this is, these are the dimensions of the experiment. It's basically uh, 36 times 3.6 square meters size of that city only. There are a certain size of the buildings. It's all quantified. Number of buildings. And uh, this is, uh, reflects the computation effort. Say so this is the number of mesh cells, 13,271,000. Okay, so it's a big discretization. It's not a small problem. The number of uh, degrees of freedom is, of course, bigger than because each, with each mesh size, so you have more degrees of freedom. So this is um, as 97 million, 626,240 degrees of freedom. This simulation. People are interested in simulating tsunamis. They are interested in simulating flooding problems like this. This, this you would be up. Okay, that's typical. So the maximal number of cells appearing in the uh, adaptive mesh is only 623,000. With the same axis. That's a big difference. If you, turn in, if, you, if, and if you think in terms of simulations that have to be repeated in order to calibrate some parameters, then it's a big difference. But still, 48 hours CPU on a cluster. So it's a heavy computation. Condensed in a, in a, in a, in a short video, this, this looks like this. Okay, I should, oh, well, maybe I have to do that here. No. Jesus. That's not good. I should show you this video. Maybe it has to do with the setting. Sorry. Maybe you can show it at some other point. It's, a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting. Well, this is typically happening. Can't help it right now. To the ones who are interested, I will do it later. Now, that was on the direct side for on, on, on model-based approaches. And now, where is a, a class, a, a, a typical point where these two worlds meet? And I would like to, to highlight just one aspect of it because it will play a role in, in what we will be talking about. It's the role of reduced models in this case. So again, if you think in terms of a parameter-dependent family of PDEs, and uh, you would like to and think of a, of a problem where you have to solve the solution of the PDE for many different parameters. So what's called a frequent query problem. 
like optimal control. Usually when you have an optimal control, when you would like to steer, to, to, to choose that state in the solution manifold that has a certain optimality property, then you, you often do that by a descent method where you go step by step in your parameter domain, try to find an optimum. That means each time when you do an iteration, you have to solve your, your problem. So each query of a parameter to, to, to query the, the solution for a given parameter means you solve a big problem. Maybe you have 79 million unknowns before as we saw. So, and here is the idea, is one idea of a, of, of a reduced model. So what you could try to do is to find in your space where the solutions are supposed to live, that you, find a possibly small subspace. Possibly small subspace. Which now depends on the problem. And that subspace is indexed by an epsilon here. That is your target accuracy. You say, I would like to solve my problems with a certain target accuracy rigorously. So you could try to find the subspace with the following property. Take any element in the solution manifold that is a possible state for some parameter. Approximate it from that subspace. That gives an error. Now take the worst error. This is the distance from the solution manifold between solution manifold and subspace. And you want to choose the subspace in such a way that this maximal distance is less than epsilon. That means whatever is in that solution manifold with that subspace, you can get it within target accuracy epsilon. That is a very strong notion of a reduced space. You control the worst, the, the worst possible deviation for every parameter. So in sort of in the L infinity norm on the parameter set. You could also ask for a more relaxed notion to say in a least square sense. That is when you take any kind in the, in the solution manifold, you take its projection to the parameter space and you take the square square of the of, of the of the diff norm of the difference and then you integrate over the parameters and you want that to be less than epsilon. It's a weak notion. Both are possible quantified notions. And of course, once you have a space like this, you can tremendously speed up simulations in inverse tasks. So if you have a forward run now and if your reduced space here has dimension 50 but your discretization has dimension 79 million, then this is a big difference to do the forward evaluation. Now you could ask, well, how can that be? I mean, why, why, why should that reduced space only have dimension 50, while your original problem maybe was a discretization with 70 million unknowns? Well, the answer is, when you choose a finite element discretization with 70 million unknowns, these finite element functions are generic functions. They have nothing to do with your problem. They are building blocks, like microscopic building blocks, and if you want to approximate a special object very well, you may need many of those building blocks. But if you think of this, and maybe Ron is going to tell you uh, something about getting such small reduced spaces. You, you do the reading. Yeah, but I, I won't connect it to the PDE. Ah, okay, good, but you will give it, out. yes. Yeah. But this is a, can be phrased in a more abstract form. But, <clears throat> But there are instances in particular in, 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 in this connection of, uh, of uh, elliptic PDEs where the mapping that takes a parameter to the solution is even analytic. So it's very smooth, even though the solution is not rectified. But the mapping from parameter to solution is even analytic. That means you, you need relatively slow the small dimension to get, say, accuracy 10 to the minus 6 with, say, 100 basis functions. Basis but these are problem-dependent basis functions, hardwired from finite elements, which are once and for all hardwired. So that you cannot guess that. You, there is a, a price to pay in, in offline work to actually compute them. But once you have that, you have in an instance of a second, in a split of a second, you can evaluate your, your problem. It's almost like a, a direct evaluation. So, 
So that is a, an obvious uh, important role of reduced models, in particular in inverse problems, but also in forward, frequent forward simulations. It is used in state estimation, parameter estimation, and <coughs> possibly in conjunction with using observations. And that's also part of uh, what one is going to talk about under the flag of data assimilation. So simulating of measurements in such a in such a model. Okay. Of course, there are issues again. How to construct you? One is going to give a very abstract <coughs> recipe for this. How to represent the data now to join them into you? <coughs> and here's one little message. We do it with probably people don't think so much about it, but except for the so there's a distinction between the data in terms of the numbers which you get as measurements, and the functions that provide these numbers. Like, the value of the solution at a point x is a number. The function that provides that value is a DR. OK? Now, now, now you have a problem whose variation formulation lives in, say, h1. Already, the Dirac doesn't live in the dual space. It's a problem. If you, don't, if, if you don't take that into account for small scales, eventually it will kill. So, so it has to be <coughs> taken into account. So that's a simple thing. You can look for a representer of a functional or a regularized version in that Hilbert space, which is relevant for your problem. But all that you don't see if from the very beginning you simply discretize and now you have a discrete set here, a discrete set here, and now you, you go ahead. You only see it when you respect the, the, the analytic background of, of the problem. Okay. So here is the over is one overarching question. The, the people this is in, in paraphrasing what people in optimization theory all sometimes do. They say what should we do? First optimize, well, first discretize, and then optimize. Which means, first you discretize your problem, now you have a discrete problem, and now you can go to your shelf and put a discrete optimization algorithm, put it on top of it, or first <coughs> optimize in the infinite dimensional case. See what are the relevant topics, and then, in the end, discretize to the needs of the current stage of the computation. At a very beginning stage, when your accuracy tolerances are large, there's no point in having a very fine discretization. So this is more the a posteriori controlled way of what one might call, say, analysis-based computation. Let's put it this way. Okay? So that's one of the... So what is in this work? I now finally got to the end. Uh, so there are topics dealt with in this workshop, foundational aspects of reduced models, data assimilation and state estimation, structural imaging optimization, DPG, a framework for getting these stable variational formulations for a wide scope of problems, not just for one problem, like, like, like this one. Okay, so now I probably overwhelmed you, sorry. But, uh, but it, it, it may come up again. So keep your just keep your mind open. Don't be, don't be deterred too easily. Okay.